What a powerful name it is and what a powerful song. Amen? Let, let's give the Lord a round of applause. Well, thank you, music team, uh, for preparing our hearts this morning as we come to worship the Lord and His study of His Word this morning. Uh, we are in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 today as we continue our series uh, dealing here with... Um, the writings of the Apostle Paul to a church that uh, has had a few struggles along the way, shall I say. This morning, uh, the message really is surrounding one theme, and that theme is our motivation. Uh, the Word of God, I believe, is a great motivator. Would you agree with that? And for the Apostle Paul, we see that he is tremendously, tremendously motivated. And much of what we're going to talk about this morning, I'll give you four points that should motivate us. Uh, when we stop and we think about the text last Sunday, we were speaking of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And it says here, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And that is a reality that uh, for the Apostle Paul, he looked at and thought to himself, my life is preparing for that moment. Uh, everything that I'm doing is contributing to a positive outcome at that event. For the Bible tells us clearly that when he says we'll all appear, he's talking about everything being revealed. I'm not sure how that all looks. I don't know if it's just Jesus and us uh, or if others will see as well. But one of the things that's very sobering is the fact that these things that are done in this body, that's speaking of our here and now, in this life, are going to be tested by fire, so to speak, and only those things which are done that are good, that is, that are done unto the glory of the Lord, will remain. And everything else will be consumed. So he says, whatever's been done in this body, whether good or bad. The word bad, again, I reinforce the fact that he's not saying that it's either good or evil. Only people that are going to be present at the judgment seat of Christ are believers. People who have faith in Christ, they've been changed they're no longer dead in their trespasses and sins. There's another judgment at the end of the book of Revelation that speaks to those who are not in faith in Christ. So let's make sure we understand that. And so Paul is looking at the judgment seat of Christ as a reality. And for him, he is supremely motivated because he knows that this very important moment in time, the judgment seat of Christ is coming, and he wants to live his life to the fullest for Christ. And we're going to look this morning at four things that should motivate us to do the same. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? God, we approach you this morning and you are all powerful. Uh, there are so many things, Lord, that we can reflect upon that bring us a reason for thankfulness. We think of this time of year, Lord, when we are, are reminded uh, that we should be thankful. Uh, Father, we are reminded that because of the power of Christ and the reconciliation that has taken place uh, between us and yourself is, is supremely motivating to us. And Father, we are filled with joy. We are filled with thanks this morning because of the work of Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord, now, I pray, as we go to this passage of Scripture. Help us, Father, to understand it. Help us, Father, to implement the realities of it in our day-to-day -day life. May we truly uh, be moved by these words today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a lot of people in the world who are very, very dedicated. And one of the things that we're going to find in this passage of Scripture is that the Apostle Paul is absolutely one of those people who are dedicated. When we think of dedication, we oftentimes think of athletes. Athletes that are absolutely over-the-top dedicated. Uh, this uh, fellow here, he won the world's strongest man several times over. Uh, he would uh, do a ridiculous regimen of deadlifting about 660 pounds. Can you imagine that? Uh, that's, that'll get you first place in a lot of things, won't it? Uh, but I found interesting was that in the morning he would eat 10 eggs and 2 to 3 pounds of bacon. Now that's how you get it done. And you sprinkle in some, some chocolate throughout the day. You know what I'm saying? you got to have the right attitude. That's for sure true. But this man is very dedicated. Another person who's very dedicated was Michael Jordan. He wanted to be one with the ball. When the ball goes through the net, he wanted his finger on that. And possibly the best basketball player that ever lived. Here you go. Here's one for all the Raven fans. The Ravens. 
All right, so Ray Lewis would work out 8 to 10 hours a day even when the team wasn't practicing. Now that's some serious dedication, isn't it? Can you imagine that? On Thanksgiving Day, you don't even have time to eat a turkey. Well, maybe he did later on and he might have eaten two or three. <laughs> Ted Williams uh, was an amazing batter and uh, ball player. I just love Ted Williams. Uh, Ted Williams went into the last day of the season, and if he hadn't played, he would have had a 400 batting average. Not repeated since, not repeated prior, and so he's very significant for this feat. Instead of going, though, and, and saying to the manager, I don't want to play, he said the opposite. I do want to play. And so he played a doubleheader and went six for eight and raised his average from 400 to 406. Pretty cool, isn't it? Of course, we had to throw Tom Brady and TB12 in there just for <laughs> obvious reasons. <clears throat> Moving right along. <laughs> and then there's the great one, not to be confused with Tom Brady. All right. All of these people have this over-the-top dedication for the sport in which they're performing. And without this level of dedication, their greatness would not have been achieved. I oftentimes think of my cousin who, on Christmas morning after opening the presents, would go off to work out in a gym for seven hours. He worked out in a gym seven hours a day every single day of the year. That is not a trade-off that I was prepared to make. Uh, I wanted to go outside and, and play outside and skate and play a little hockey, play a little basketball, eat some turkey, uh, eat some dessert. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I enjoyed those kind of things, but I never did win a gold medal like he did. You see, the difference is our dedication. Our dedication is what really separates us, and this is what the Apostle Paul wants to get at here. And he's going to begin to talk about being motivated here starting in verse 11. And again, I remind us that everything here that we're going to look at goes back to verse 10, from we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Notice verse 11 starts with that important word, therefore. And he says this, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. The first motivational factor for the Apostle Paul was the fear of the Lord. When God is in our minds and we're thinking about our relationship to the Lord, and it's very sobering, isn't it, though, even to think of the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, when I think of the judgment seat of Christ, I, I, I'm just uh, somewhat overwhelmed. I know that my sins are paid for. I know that I'll never spend a second in, in hell because my sins are paid for. I have eternal life in Christ. But it's very sobering for me to stop and think. It's somewhat daunting in some ways to think about standing before the Lord and having all the things that are done in this body made manifest. I mean, to have all these things put to the fire, put to the test, and to see what remains. Paul said it this way, the fear of the Lord is motivating me. And for Paul, I'm sure he looked at it and he was very concerned about what this is going to look like when he is standing before the Lord. And I think it's very healthy for us uh, to have the same fear of the Lord. He is not talking about being terrified by the presence of Almighty God. But he is saying that he has a healthy respect for the power of Christ and the presence of Christ. And so he knows he's going to stand before the Lord someday and it is a motivational factor in his life. Notice what he does as a response to the fear of the Lord. There in verse 11, he says, we're out there persuading men. We're persuading men. He's seeing the need for those in the world to come to Jesus Christ. And he is supremely motivated by this. He is thinking to himself that there are two judgments. And he would not want anyone to end up appearing before the Lord at the great white throne judgment with their names not written in the Lamb's book of life and an eternity in hell awaiting them. Paul is urging those who are around him. He's trying to persuade them to place their faith in Jesus Christ so that one day they'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have the opportunity for rewards, those things done for Christ in their flesh while they were living, while we are all living. And he says, I want to see that duplicated in the lives of others. Now Paul is going to go on, he's very clear about this, that this is a matter of the heart. He goes on in this passage, verse 13, he says, for if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. You see, those things which are taking place in his heart are internal. 
Notice just backing up to verse 12, he says, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in the heart. It's all about our heart, isn't it? Uh, we can make life appear to be a lot of different things, but it really comes down to our motivation. And the motivation is in our heart. Paul's looking at it and he's saying, I am so motivated because of the fear of the Lord, the respect I have for the Lord, and I, what I know to be f- true, that I am supremely motivated to persuade others to place their faith in Christ. If anything is missing in the church today, it is our desire to persuade people to place their faith in Christ. The church just seems to want to roll along without sensing the urgency, and yet this is the crux of why we're here. To share our faith with others. There should not be a church activity that's done in any church that names the name of Jesus Christ where the gospel of Jesus Christ is not presented. It should be presented clearly. It should be presented with urgency because people are dying without Christ all over this planet and their eternity is hell. For Paul, Paul is so motivated that he makes this crazy statement here. He says to them in that verse For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are of sound mind, he says, it's for you. Have you ever heard that saying? I heard it a lot when I was a kid. He was beside himself. What does that even mean? Like, how do you, like, get beside yourself? Have you ever wondered that? I am so thankful for their, there's other translations, too. You know, and you go to these other translations. I'm reading the Holman Bible, and uh, it says this it doesn't say beside himself it says that Paul was literally out of his mind oh okay that makes sense I I, I understand better out of your mind versus beside yourself you see the interesting thing was Paul says that before God we're out of our minds you're out of your mind if you're a follower of Jesus Christ you say well what do you mean by that Pastor Kevin what what is Listen, the Christian life doesn't make sense to the world. Would we agree about that? I mean, why in the world are you here on a Sunday morning? It's beautiful outside. How many of us have leaves to rake? You know what I'm saying? I, I, I went to town yesterday. I, I blew those things around my yard with a blower. I raked them up and put them on a tarp and hauled them to the woods. And, and then I got my mower out and I put the bag on it for the first time. And I chiseled up all those leaves and threw them all into the woods. And I got up this morning and God put them back. Uncle, (laughs) now they can blow wither and thither and yawn, okay? It's over. I'm done. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, there's a limit to this. Now, you could be here or you could be at home dealing with those leaves. You could be doing a lot of things. How many of you here are busy people? You're a busy person. Hold them up and keep them up if you're busy. Okay, in your own mind, you are a busy person. We would agree that it's important to read God's word. How in the world are you supposed to do that? You get up in the morning, it's early enough already, right? What compels you to even want to pick up the Bible and read the Bible every day? You say, Pastor Kevin, I am so busy, but why do you do it? Paul would say you do it because you're out of your mind. Why do you come to church on Sunday? Why do you worship God? Because you're out of your mind. It may not make sense, but Paul is saying, I'm out there persuading people because when it comes to my relationship with God, I am out of my mind. Now, don't get too carried away because he says right after that, but to you, the Corinthian people, he says, you know, we're exercising self-control here. Uh, We're we're level-headed and sober-minded. But Paul is making it very clear that what he is doing, he's doing because he is out of his mind for Jesus Christ. Why in the world would he throw away the, the job that he had as a Pharisee? Why would, he, why would he stop doing what he was doing? It was lucrative. He was becoming wealthy. Why do people follow Jesus Christ and throw aside their own pursuits and instead follow the direction of the Holy Spirit of God? Why do people become missionaries and why do people serve? Why do you spend time studying for your Sunday school class Why do you do all of those things? Why do you share your faith with others, maybe family members who would put you out of the family because you dare to mention the name of Christ? We do it because we're out of our mind for Jesus. We do it because we're absolutely convinced 
that it is worthy that he is the pinnacle of all things. And it might not appear sane to the world, but it does appear sane to God. Are you with me? That's what Paul is saying. It's like we're out of our mind before the Lord. God wants us to have the same desire that the Apostle Paul had. We are motivated because of the fear of the Lord. But it's not our only motivation. Second of all, we're motivated because of our love of Christ. Notice this next verse. Again, it's going to tell us, for the love of Christ, verse 14, controls us. The love of Christ controls us. There is something about the fact that that Christ loves us and that Christ controls us. This is how Paul saw himself. He could say, I'm out of my mind for Christ because the truth of the matter is he was being overwhelmed by the love of Christ. Wasn't it wonderful singing that last song? I mean, it just gets you so excited. And you're so thrilled over the dynamic of what God has done, all powerful God, who has sent Jesus Christ to this earth, who now has shown his love to me. Paul says, I am overwhelmed by the love of Christ. You and I should feel the same way. There should never be a day goes by that we're not impressed with the love of Christ. We observe the Lord's Supper here on a monthly basis because we want to be remembering his sacrifice. We want to be thankful and we want to be overwhelmed by the love of Christ. Paul says that the love of Christ is so great that it has impressed him forever. Think of Romans. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were still sitting, Christ died for us. There is an overwhelming factor of the love of Christ. Not only does Paul say that the love of Christ is something that really smites us, but it controls us. Uh, The word there, controlled, means to be restrained or constrained. It's the idea that we're kind of tied up. We're not free. Uh, It could also be used and was used in certain documents to speak of that which uh, to hold in custody. What Paul is saying is, I'm in the custody of Jesus Christ. I'm over, so overwhelmed by his love for me that it is a motivating factor in my life. I don't feel the, the openness to go and pursue my own desires. Instead, I feel the constraints. I am so overwhelmed by the love of Christ that I am not living my life for myself. I'm instead living my life for the Lord. Notice what he says after this, and we won't develop it, but He says, and he died for all. That is, he says, one died for all, speaking of Jesus. Therefore, he says, all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Make it very clear, Jesus died for us. And in Jesus' death for us, by showing that type of love, we have died to ourselves. That's what Paul's saying. So no longer do I live life to myself, I live it to Christ. And if you're going to be dedicated and live your life for Christ, then be out of your mind for Jesus Christ. Be dedicated, more dedicated than those athletes that are spending countless hours doing crazy things to be at their top of their game. Be committed to the point where you're willing to say, I am not living life for myself. I am living life for Jesus Christ. He controls me. That's a motivating factor, isn't it? It's so overwhelming when we stop to think about the ramifications of the love of Christ. One of the ramifications is seen here, and it's our third point, as a motivation factor here, we should be understanding that we've been changed. And I take you to verse 17. It's a, it's a popular verse. It's a well-known verse of Scripture. And Paul writes, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, what does it mean to be in Christ? You and I, if we're to have eternal life, we have to be in Christ. We have to place our faith in Christ. Jesus becomes our Savior. He is, and we are in a relationship, a personal relationship that we have now with Jesus Christ. We are immersed into the body of Christ. We are in Christ. The Bible says there in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creature. He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Now, what I want you to see is the next word after he says, old things are passed away. 
the next word is the word behold. It can also be translated look. And the idea here in the Greek is that this is not just a glance, but it's a long stare. It's a look with intention. You are intent on seeking to see this, and so it's almost like you're looking through it with binoculars. You want to find out all the details, and so you, you study it with your eyes. You see, what God is saying is, look, everything is new. It's not just a paint job, folks. It's, it's not just a paint job. What we're talking about is something that has been transformed, and that which is old has passed away, and this is now new, and it is spectacular. And he says to us, look at it. Behold it. Look at the person whose life has been transformed. This is not a Christianity that's done in secret. This is open. When the transformation takes place, the world should be able to see that now you are truly changed. Do you believe that? What is normative in Scripture is that there is a significant change in the life of every single person who places their faith in Christ. The Bible is very clear. He says, look, there's a change. Notice with me, he says after that, now all these things are from God. This change is from God. He has reconciled us to himself, and he has done this through Christ. And that is amazing. When someone needs to be reconciled, it means that there are two parties that are feuding. They're at odds with each other. Oftentimes we don't stop to consider the reality of having a poor relationship, shall I say, with God. People might say, well, I've always been a Christian. I'll interpret that to mean that you were born into a family that practices Christianity. But none of us are born Christians. In fact, the scriptures could not be clearer. Every one of us is born bent away from God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In fact, before you came out of your mother's womb, you were a sinner because it started at the moment of conception. You see, the problem then is that I need to be reconciled to a holy God. And being a sinner, this reconciliation needs to take place. Now, listen to me. Several of you last week raised your hands because God was at work in your life on this very matter of salvation and being reconciled to God. God wants to reconcile you to himself. And in fact, he has done all the work that's necessary. You don't do any work for salvation. Can we make that very, very clear? You place your faith in Jesus Christ, and it's a result of a process, but understand that God is the one who has made this way possible, and he made this possible by sending Jesus Christ to this earth to die in your place, and that is the only way you and I can be reconciled, because you and I, let's make it really clear this morning, you and I are the offenders, and God is the offended. And normally the offender goes to the offended. But in our situation, there is absolutely nothing good dwelling within us. And so we have nothing to offer the offended. And so God in his wisdom, his mercy, and his great love sends Jesus Christ to this earth so that we can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Which means faith in Christ is what we need to to exercise and then what happens is the work of Christ on the cross where he paid for our sin is credited to our account and we are reconciled with the offended God now that is an important important truth and if you're here today and you're thinking about what is my relationship to God really like I'm not sure if I've been reconciled to God God desires for you today to place your faith in Jesus Christ and know that that reconciliation has taken place. How do you do that? The Bible tells us whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you call upon his name? Will you see yourself as the offender? Will you understand that he, a holy God, has been offended? 
And will you come and place your faith in Christ? Paul looks at his life and he says, we're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, take a look. See for yourself. This is, this is a changed man. And understand the reason for the change is I've been reconciled to God. Are you ready for this next one? Notice what he says here. He says, now all these things, verse 18, are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and get this, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You and I have received the ministry of reconciliation. We have been reconciled to Christ, and now it is our responsibility to take, he says there, the word of reconciliation to the world that so desperately needs to hear it. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And you and I have been given now the ministry of the word of reconciliation. Again, we need to go out there into the, the, the highways and byways. We need to interact with the people that are in our world. And we need to exclaim to them the glories of what God has done in allowing us to be reconciled to him. Now, that's a, that's a pretty tall responsibility, isn't it? But it is one that has been committed to us. The fourth point here is we have a job to do. And you see this here in verse 20. In verse 20, it speaks to this point. When he tells us, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors for Christ. There's somebody that lived on our streets, passed away now, but he was an ambassador to a European country. Someone in the neighborhood told me that. He was an older gentleman, but many of the years of his life were spent as an ambassador. I was impressed with that. I was, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, if the president called you up this afternoon and said, you know, I want you to be an ambassador someplace, I mean, how would you feel about that? Especially if it was Aruba, I mean, that'd be cool. <laughs> right? I mean, oh well, yeah, I'll go. Can I be an ambassador to Hawaii? I mean, that would really be the ultimate, right? Well, see, the idea here is that an ambassador is a really responsible uh, position. Diplomatic official, this is the official definition of the highest rank sent by one sovereign or state to another as its resident representative you are the representative the resident representative now get that the resident representative and that's why you have to move if you become an ambassador to Aruba you'd have to pick up your whole family and you'd have to move to Aruba wouldn't that be a shame now Understand, we are the resident representative of Jesus Christ. Christ who is in the heavens has a representative here and his representation is the church, the followers of Christ. We are then ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And as ambassadors for Christ, we have a responsibility to do something very, very important. Notice what he says here. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. And then he says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Wow. You see, as the ambassador for Jesus Christ, I'm to tell others about this reconciliation. And Paul even says it in the strongest of terms. We're to go out there and we're to beg them to place their faith in Christ. Understand what the stakes are. The stakes couldn't be higher. This is a, an amazing reality. And when we understand that at stake here is heaven and hell for all of eternity, if that doesn't motivate you, my friend, you need to look at your own heart. The thought of people dying without Jesus Christ should affect us tremendously. We should stop to consider how we're using our life for Christ. And ask God if he wants us to use it in a different manner. It should so urge us to follow him. We are his representatives. And if Jesus was here on the earth, he would see people and have compassion on them and desire for them to be saved. And he would beg them not to live this life without the saving grace that he alone can bring. 
Not to live this life for themselves. Not to live this life with a hopelessness. Not to live this life in the pursuit of earthly gains. Those things which will be burned up. But he says, I would beg them. This is what you and I are supposed to be doing. My friends, listen. The church of Christ is not doing that so much today. We live our lives with an apathetic attitude towards the lost. Many of us here are going to have unsaved family members in our homes this Thursday. Or you're going to be at their home. And my friends, you need to know and understand you are a representative of Jesus Christ. You're the resident representative at places like work or even the gas station or wherever. You are that representative for Christ. And so we should be motivated by the job that God has given us to do. Key points for us to consider this morning. We need to look beyond ourselves to the needs of others. We need to understand you can't get too carried away in your devotion to the Lord. Amen? Do you believe that? I mean, I love that song, Jesus Freak. I just think that's awesome. Okay? I just, yeah, I used to play that on my ringtone on my phone. And, and for 10 years or more. And I just love that song. This is what we're supposed to be about. And listen, I like getting around people that are crazier than me. I just really do. I love it. You get around people and they're talking about serving the Lord and doing this for God and doing that for God. And they're not just slowing down and just going kaput. They're on fire for Jesus. I like to be around people like that. Do you like to be around people like that? I don't much care to be around people that are just Laodicean sitting back doing nothing, just waiting for the end. I want to see people that are fired up for Jesus. You can't get too carried away for Jesus. You can get too carried away for your friends, but you can't get too carried away for Jesus. And that's what Paul said. It's between me and God, and I'm out of my mind. But around you, I'll be self-controlled. <laughs> Another point for us to stop and consider is that Christ's love for us should move us. When we stop to consider the sacrifice was made, and the love that was given, it should have an effect on our hearts. Remember, too, that you're not modified. You're not just painted over. It wasn't a restoration project. You're new, he says. And that changes the way in which we even think and conduct our lives. Key action point. Live like you are Christ's representative here on the earth, carrying out the ministry of reconciliation. Imagine if the church buys into this reality. Imagine what that would look like. To mobilize the church with such a thought could change how the world operates. And people could come to Christ all over. There is much to do. And God has given us the opportunity to be his ambassadors. What will you do with that opportunity? That's the question we all need to answer. Let's bow our heads together, shall we? Let me ask you this morning, maybe you're here today, and maybe you were here last Sunday, and God's been doing a work in your life. I prayed for several last week who weren't sure about where they were going to spend their eternal destination. Maybe God's at work in your heart today. Maybe you raised your hand last week. Maybe you'd just like to know more. Well, the folks here at the front that would be happy to pray with you, you can see me. I'd be more than glad to, to spend some time talking to you. God's at work in your heart. God's in work in your life. You're not sure about your eternal destination. You're not sure if you've been reconciled to Christ. If that's the case, and I can pray for you this morning. I'm happy to do that. Just slip up your hand that I could pray for you today. If God's at work in your heart this morning. Thank you. I wonder how many are here that say, I, I'm a follower of Christ. But I've been sidetracked. I certainly haven't been out of my mind for Christ. And God's speaking to your heart about a new level of dedication to the Lord. I'd love to pray for all of us this morning who God is challenging our hearts. Just slip up your hand. I'd be happy to pray for you. You're, God's at work in your life. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you.
for the work that you're doing in our hearts and minds. Be with these, Lord, who've asked for prayer, that, Lord, they would find the peace and assurance that they are reconciled to Christ. Reconciled ultimately to God through Christ. May you do a great work in their hearts this week, I pray. And Father, I pray for others, Lord, who've asked, Lord, uh, for prayer because God is at work in their hearts. Lord, you know what that greater level of dedication looks like, enthusiasm and so forth. Father, you know exactly what's happening in all of our hearts. And I pray, Father, that we would step out of the way as ourselves and allow you, Father, to control us. Help us, Father, to remember that one has died and now all have died. We die to ourselves, as the scripture says, so that we might not live our lives to ourselves, but for others. Help us, Lord, to understand these things. And may we all be committed to a ministry of reconciliation, that you might receive the glory for all of it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning, it's been great to be in the house of the Lord. It's been great to worship the Lord. Uh, it truly has been. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're really glad that you, you spent the time to come and, and be a part of the service this morning. Uh, out by our giving boxes, there's a little rack above it. Uh, there's a, um, a visitor's form there if you want to fill that out and exchange it at the uh, welcome desk in the foyer for a gift bag. You can do that. Um, that's a pretty good deal. And so uh, we won't harass you, I promise. Um, but if you'd like to do that, that'd be awesome. Also, uh, again, uh, we don't pass the offering plate, but there are the giving boxes in the back. So just a reminder to our regular attenders. Coming up this week, starting tonight, today's the first day of the week, isn't it? So, so tonight, first night of the week, uh, we have a praise service that will be here, and we'll be getting together. There'll be some music, and there'll be some opportunity to give Thanksgiving testimonies, and so that's at 6.30 tonight, so just encourage you that way. Bring a dessert to share. We're, we, you know, we got to have some food here, so bring a dessert to share, and uh, make sure it's low-cal, no carbs, and et cetera, right? Um, <laughs> And we'll have a nice time of fellowship, nice time praising the Lord, 6.30 tonight. Also, read your bulletin. There's a lot of announcements in there, uh, all kinds of things. There's a lot of women's ministry things that are happening. There's sign-ups out there in the foyer uh, for several things right now. Make sure you take a moment to do that. We have a men's dinner coming up in December. You can sign up for that. So just check it all out. I think there's a football game, uh, a turkey bowl game. Uh, is that here at the church, Steve? 9 o'clock Thursday morning, so if you want to break a leg or whatever. <laughs> the la I, five years ago, I played in one of these, and I spent almost the afternoon at the ER. <laughs> it was terrible. I wasn't hurt. I was with somebody else who was, and ay ay ay. So anyway, I'll either be here or I won't. Let's stand. We'll have a word of prayer. As we pray, I just trust you all be blessed at Thanksgiving and have just a wonderful Thanksgiving time, uh, whatever you choose to, uh, to be doing. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to worship you this morning. May you just bless us, Lord, as we go our separate ways. May we go as ambassadors for Christ, committed to the ministry of reconciliation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.